girls come down to meet our company or whatever. And I'd come downstairs and him being like, all my daughters are virgins as I'm walking into the room. And I'm just like, what the literal fudge sickles. Hi, beautiful Hi, people. Beautiful people. <laughs> this is my dear friend, Sophia Spolino. We connected via the internet. I have such a love hate relationship with the internet. It drives me insane. And then also connects me to people like Sophia. So I can't Aww. hate it too much. <laughs> Before we jump into this conversation, I just want to remind you that we have God is Gray merch at last. I collaborated with Mara O'Hara. She is a Los Angeles based tattoo artist. And we created this RIP Purity Culture t-shirt, which pairs perfectly with this conversation. You can find the link below on Teespring. And don't forget that I'm also a Thinks ambassador. Thinks is a product that I absolutely love for all period having people. So go click below for my offer code. I'm going to read this beautiful description I have written out here. Sophia Spolino is an old spiritual soul that happens to be in a 28-year-old woman's body. She has been in the influencing world for years, beginning as a YouTubing evangelical, evangelical harpist with preaching videos, and now is an extremely progressive Christian that hosts the top 100 personal development podcast, Enlightened. Not only is she known for what she believes, she's a TikTok and Instagram influencer that promises to deliver raw content that isn't packaged with ads. And once you watch her IG stories, it will be like the reality TV show you can't stop watching. I agree. <laughs> Recently, she decided to share her wisdom and knowledge as a dating life coach, as well as consulting women and building their own brands online. She is committed to sharing the good, bad, and the ugly for the world to see and learn from together. Anyone that doesn't know Sophia, you might feel like, like, oh, this is reverse. I don't know what you're talking about, but this is really, this sums you up very beautifully because <laughs> you've been like stepping your toe out more and more. Yeah. Even I've witnessed it just in the short time that we've been friends of you just like experimenting, be like, oh, I'm going to tell people I also believe this. And I'm going to tell people I also mm -hmm. believe this and just like leading them into more comfortability as you share more of yourself. Obviously, mm -hmm. I, I think you've been seeing your audience share more of themselves. Absolutely. And I'm trying to think back to when I first saw your content for the like for very first time. I don't know when it may have been last July. So it's been maybe I would say like 10 months of following you. And then when I went to LA, I was like, let's go meet up together. And then we got to hang out in person. It was so great. So yeah, I definitely have been influenced by seeing you step out more. And you when I first discovered you, it was almost a trigger um, hearing you bring up like sex work and things that I was not willing to talk about publicly and beliefs that I w had for myself, but didn't even talk out loud about yet because I grew up so, so strict. <laughs> yeah. I'm so honored to hear that. And that this is what I love so much that all of us can bounce off of each other. And every time I hear that God is gray has influenced someone to make a video or to write a blog or to do anything artistic or like bold and brave on their own. It's really the, the most that I could ask for from either mm. of our platforms. It's so beautiful. Yeah. You, you made me see that I'm not the only progressive Christian. And when I met you, I was saying that term and I didn't really know anyone else who used it to identify. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it was really cool to find that community. So thank you for that. I love it. Um, I know I definitely flubbed the intro a couple of times, but there's definitely oh. some things I want to unpack in there. Um, we are going to be talking about age gap relationships because that is something that you are in. And then also a little bit about purity culture and corporal punishment because you know a lot of us have these very unique stories from evangelicalism but they manifested in similar and different ways um it's like very unifying some of these terrible toxic theologies that we were taught so can yeah. we start with you being a, a harpist evangelical <laughs> give us a little yeah. bit of the backstory of sophia I started on YouTube, uh, I want to say, okay, so I'm 28. So I started when I was 15. So that's a long time of being on YouTube. And at first I was like the main harpist. Uh, it's really fun to say like, oh my gosh, that was like my heyday, millions of views. And now it's like not like, it's really hard to get popular on YouTube. So that was what I did in the beginning. And then I would do preaching videos. And of course I made 
I played, <laughs> it's now private, <laughs> but at one point I'd put like duct tape on my mouth and played over the rainbow as like a salute to the unborn children who were aborted. And like, I just felt like I had to be, you know, as an evangelical girl, I had to talk about God all the time and like push my b- very strict re- beliefs on everybody. So that's what my channel was about <laughs> other than heart videos. Uh, I do not envy you. I'm so lucky and happy to say that I was not on the internet when I was in this phase <laughs> of life. Cause I relate to you. I keep saying that I made this paper mache art project when I was 15 of a nine month old pregnant woman holding a gun to her belly. And I called it abortion. Uh, I was always arguing with my biology teacher, uh, with Ken Hoven, you know, apologetics yeah. and stuff. So I guess what we have in common for real is that we've always had this heart to like bring people into the fold of what we truly love, which is like the divine and Jesus and everything, but it just manifested in completely different ways according to like what we grew up with. Absolutely. And I think your audience might relate to this feeling too. Aside from just the love and passion we have for Jesus, we were actually taught to be afraid of not speaking about Jesus as if, if we wouldn't bring it into every single area of our life, whether that's work, play, every single friend, if we didn't introduce them to Jesus, like that would be a sin. And, um, I I always like feared like, Oh, one day I'll get to heaven and God will be like, Oh, you didn't tell him about me in this proper way. So yeah, yeah. (laughs) no, you're right. You're touching on something so real, that anxiety that we feel. And it's fair, by the way, if you really believe that unsaved quote, people are going to go to hell, that's terrifying. When you truly love people, that is a really terrifying concept. And one of the other things that I will say, and I can say on your platform, probably nowhere else because the audience would be like freaked out by it, but your people were ready to hear this. I actually was that girl on Facebook that had changed my profile picture to like the equality sign with the slash in it back whenever um, the whole fight over LGBTQ marriage rights, all that was going on. I truly thought it was my place and my platform to be like, I don't agree with this because that's not in the Bible. Isn't that wow. disturbing? Like, that was me. I've had this 180 shift. I used to stand at abortion clinics and speak with love. Like, I never yelled at anybody, but like, there was, there's no place for anyone to go protest at those places, regardless of what you believe. You should not be protesting. And now I have completely different beliefs. <laughs> Let's get that straight. But at the same time, like, I want to say this out loud. Because it, it's so freeing to like say it that we have to uh, for there, there's a picture that comes out of me being at those places. <laughs> right. People aren't shocked because I that's the stuff I used to post. Oh so, my goodness. Yes. I evolved I, a lot. I feel you. So let's get into that journey because I think it's so interesting. We're really going to focus on how these concepts and belief systems played into the relationships that you mm-hmm. had and were cultivating yeah. at that moment. And like the irony of how unhealthy a purity culture relationship can be versus an emancipated progressive Christian, you know, relationship, even with a quote, non-Christian, even with the kind of guy that you're not supposed to be with. So right. <laughs> yeah, let's, where so, do we start with that? I mean, I know your story about marriage and everything. Maybe start there. Okay. Yeah. I'll start there. So Well, actually back it up in college. College was kind of weird for me because I went to LSU, great school, known famously to be a party school, but I was homeschooled and extremely evangelical. So going there as a virgin taught to not drink or go out dancing, like that is so wrong. I was always afraid. Like my dad would tell me that if I ever see a boy at your house past a certain time, like I will take away your harp. Like I was studying music and fashion. Like if he took away my harp, it would be devastating to my career, my life. So I was always threatened with these things. Like I won't help you with your bills through college, blah, 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 blah. So that was always a pressure. And then going back in childhood, I was threatened with corporal punishment and was like consistently throughout my whole life spanked with the belt for like dumb reasons, like things that you could look back and be like, I ran in the house and I got spanked. Um, and my dad would do this while I was naked until I was 12 years old. So it was very shameful for me. I've never actually 
talked about this publicly because I don't want to shame my dad. My yeah. parents were in all so many ways, absolutely incredible. And I think they were doing the best they can because of the culture that they were in in the church back in the 80s and 90s. My parents were wild. My dad was in like a held up at gunpoint and laughed at. Um, and that's when he became a Christian because he realized in that moment he could have died. And so he needed something that was so over the top. I think in that moment, it was so different than the way that I see Jesus now, but like, it was just this shift in lifestyle. So he was so passionate. He brought that to us and there were beautiful parts about it and there were terrible parts about it, but that punishment also, I've never really processed this out loud. But I think the fact that I was spanked absolutely butt naked till I was 12. I mean, I was already getting pubic hair. Like it was a very shameful thing. Now he, I don't remember him ever like looking at me front on or anything like that. I've never had sexual abuse with my family at all. So I'm very grateful that's not a part of my story, but still bending over like with your, like, that's just so like, I remember the last time it happened, I was just so scared. Um, mm. and I was 12. I mean, that's just too old. That's and then the last time it happened fully clothed, it was with a piece of molding. He took me into his barn cause I had said I would run away. Um, which I obviously wouldn't have run away, but apparently he was talking back and he took me into his barn and took out a piece of molding like woodwork and spanked me with that. I was clothed, but he shut all the doors. Like I was so scared. It was like, he shut me in there and I was trapped. It was very scary. So that's, that's my corporal punishment story. <laughs> that's so, so, yeah, it's really wild and interesting to process because the way we've defined abuse over the years, like for example, when I was in my emotionally abusive relationship, I still couldn't process it as abusive because I thought abuse meant you have a black eye or abuse meant, you know, everyone could see it. Like you just had all these concepts of what it actually is yeah. like you think oh I have to be locked in a closet for days without food and just like but what is the line I think the line is actually much more clear than we thought which is do not bring pain fear and shame into your child's life mm. that's your responsibility to me as a parent to protect them from these things because the more I've delved into my spirituality and the more I've read the bible and Jesus's words it's very clear to me that the enemy quote of our faith is fear shame and and pain and how we like process that the thing is if you raise up your child with love and teaching that child like basic human respect for all beings you will have a soft-hearted child who respects you and who you don't mean to spank i never needed it to be abused to understand that i hurt my parents heart if they would have talked to me and said hey, what you said really hurt me. Like, do you see how this breaks my heart? Immediately, that would have been enough to like be like, oh, I'm so sorry. And I just encourage parents out there to really think about that. <laughs> if you're actually teaching them compassion, that should be all it takes most of the time. So being infused with shame and modesty culture and then at the same time mm -hmm. being hit and spanked naked, yeah. What a, what a weird. And, and that's coming from like a good, yeah, it's coming from a good family. Like I'm telling you, like my family is good all around. This is just the way they were taught. And they thought it was a sin not to do this. Like my dad would counsel other people being like, it's a sin if you don't discipline your children this way. Cause you're breaking these verses in the Bible where they talk about, you know what I'm saying? Right. So then Paris with purity culture. My dad took me on a date when I was 12, opened all the doors um, told me I should never let a man touch above my knee, um, like your kneecap. Like eventually if you're dating, if he wants to put his hand on your knee, that's fine. But anything past your kneecap, that is terrible. If a man puts his hand on your breast, God forbid, before you're married, like it's terrible. Um, and I had to promise purity to my father. And I still remember to this day until I was married, um, he had made me a purity ring and everything. He would actually brag to other people, men and women. It was very shameful for me to walk in when my dad's like, oh, come meet my girls, come down to meet our company or whatever. And I'd come downstairs and him being like, all my daughters are virgins. As I'm walking into the room and I'm just like, what the literal fudge sickles? I mean, that just makes you feel like, I don't know. It's like if they had a son, it'd be like, so they're gonna be really good girls for your sons potentially, blah, blah, blah. Just 
I was always like this like cow, I guess. Like I felt like a cow. <laughs> like don't oh give him gosh. the milk for free kind of thing constantly said. So yeah. And that's so wild. I mean, everything you just said is so wild and I'm laughing so I don't cry because that is just insane. Right. But um, it reminds me of Lori Alexander is God help her, um, a terrible YouTuber. Um, she's like much older and she talks about, you know, these ideas over and over again. And she says, why do we make such a sacred cow of sex? Like just have sex with your husband was her argument. Like just have sex with him when he wants to. That's your wifely duty. Stop making such a sacred cow of it. And it just reminded me because my argument to that was like, what do you mean don't make such a sacred cow of it? Like our culture, our Christian culture was so obsessed with sex, continues oh, to be so is. obsessed. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and Christians keep doing this thing where they're like, you know, Christians are afraid to talk about sex. So I'm not afraid to. And it's like, no, you talk about sex all the time. You just talk all around it. You talk yep. about black and white. You talk about, you know, all these impossible standards to uphold. So I mean, that's just wild. So how do you even come out of being paraded around as a quote yep. virgin and then start trying to date and feel- You anymore? don't. It, yeah. it, it was my identity. Being a virgin harpist was my identity. At one point I was very much um, like in a bad relationship with a guy long distance who messaged me, told me that like God told him I was going to be his wife and you're a harpist. I always wanted to marry a virgin Puerto Rican harpist. And I'm a youth pastor in Los Angeles. And like, for me, that was like, oh, God must have told you like, this guy was a terrible, I still think like he's probably um, sexually abusing kids like in LA as a quote unquote pastor, but we're not even going to go there. Well, all I'm saying is it did not prepare me mentally to, to look for the right things. Like I literally exploited myself. Like I would tell people like, Yes, I'm a virgin. I'm waiting till marriage. And it almost makes guys want to be the winner of that game and like break you down. Totally. So, yeah. Yeah. So sick. So I didn't know I was doing that to myself because that's what I was taught. But at the end of all that, I thought I found an amazing guy. After college, I went to LA and my fourth day moving from Louisiana to Los Angeles, I met an incredible guy. And at least that's what I thought. He took me to church three different churches in LA, a mega church, the dream center, which I still love, freaking love the dream center. We went to another big church that was like the Judah Smith church where the celebrities go. And then we would go to like a hole in the wall, like helping them build up their home church type church three times a week. Loved it. He oh. was the man of God, like that I was always told I would meet. I'm a little rebel at heart. He was African-American mix. He looked like Bruno Mars, sexy as hell, <laughs> not so sexy on the inside. And having any attraction for him and us having attraction for each other, sexy attraction was just so wrong. So because he was, I had made mistakes in college. Like I had oral sex in college, um, quote unquote mistakes, whatever. I really yeah. loved the person that I did it with at the time, but it was a mistake, you know, um, so, quote unquote, feeling guilty. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so with him, I was like, we have to just like wait for everything to marriage. Cause I was still technically like an intercourse virgin. Cause Lord knows there's a lot of us technical virgins out there. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, we're going to wait for everything because you're my husband. Like, this is it. So we moved home from Los Angeles to like small town, Louisiana after six months, convince him to move home with me. I was very manipulative about that. Looking back, it was like a lot of pressure. Like I'm a Southern girl. I want to be around my family. If you love me, you're going to move here. And he had to start his whole life in Louisiana, which is kind of hard for a guy who is like mixed and like didn't have a college degree. Like it was asking a lot because the South does have prejudices and you know, it was a sacrifice for him. So I do acknowledge that my parents were so welcoming to him. Everyone in my life, so welcoming. And within a year from moving there, he proposed, but I do believe that proposal did come from pressure of, Hey, I want to be married. I want to have sex. Like, not that he was ever pressuring of sex. Like he was good in that way. He was the good Christian guy but we were not a right fit for each other. We were just really attracted to each other. 
Do you relate with that? Uh, uh, Yeah. (laughs) No, I totally, yeah, same thing. I got married because I felt terribly guilty about sex and, and then you're not asking the right questions, you know, like I know a lot of Christians get like Christian counseling, quote unquote, but then it's, you know, you can, you can be like, oh, we want the same amount of kids. We want to move to the same place. We have the same spiritual belief, which maybe you do, maybe you don't. Maybe you're just saying that you do. But um, as far as actually like aligning and giving yourself the space to breathe and to be like, is this right for me? Is this wrong? Like there's mm. not really room or space to do that in Christian dating and definitely not in quote courtship dating because that's dating no. where you're just like headed towards the altar. Yes. I forgot to mention that when I was in high school, my dad only allowed for courtship. If I said I was dating someone, he would correct me and say I was courting someone and only with intention of marriage. So there was always that pressure and shame when a relationship would end because I felt I had failed um, in my parents' eyes. So I, I do believe that's why I went on with this wedding because I was so afraid of like breaking another courtship publicly. Also, we were that Christian couple that would YouTube and vlog together. So there were those pressures. Um, Here's the thing. He was a decent guy, but he, and he probably still is, but he had a lot of childhood wounding just like me and it wasn't processed. One of the first things that his aunt told me when I met her was, are you sure you want to go down this path of marriage? Cause he's got a lot of dark stuff that even he can't remember. Cause he was so tortured as a child that like, he doesn't, he doesn't have the capacity to love. Like he's got a really dark soul right now. And even though he is a Christian, there's still a lot to work through. Mm. And I was like, I can fix him. (laughs) Can't relate to that at all. (laughs) (laughs) No, not at all. Uh, Yeah. Fixing. So it's something that like as women in purity culture and just in Christian culture, we're taught to be the fixers. We're taught to be the nurturers. Like that feminine energy is like our, our life goal to be a nurturer fixer. So I went into marriage thinking that there were a lot of red flags. Like he was so um, financially manipulative, like wouldn't let me see our credit card statements and whatnot. And then we'd get fees and then he'd yell at me for it kind of thing. Um, pay off his back taxes with our savings. Um, so manipulative. If he'd spill food on him, he would blame it on me, not giving him enough napkins. Like it was blame on me for everything. And marriage happened. Sex happened. First night. Great. I was so ready for it honeymoon amazing but then after that like my body closed up like I did not know how to appreciate sex like all that like heightened feelings for the wedding and the honeymoon it was like I have permission to feel sexy like this is my wedding night my wedding week but after that feeling sexy all the shame that I've been taught started to come up do you like does that resonate (laughs) well no I mean that definitely resonates with a lot of people I've talked to. I, I think I do relate in that I've realized I still felt guilty about sex because you could always still do it more right than you did it. So it's like, I didn't wait for the actual day. So then Mm -hmm. any issues that came up, any lack of desire that he had, I really believe he had like a Madonna whore complex with me for anyone that doesn't know that's like a, it's slang for something psychological that happens uh, to people where they categorize women as either like the virgin Madonna or the whore. And it's Mm. like, you can't have sex with your wife like the Jezebel whore. That's your Mm. wife. She's this Madonna. And I really did feel like he made this immediate switch and he almost never wanted to have sex with me in our marriage. But then when we did, I was like, Oh, well I, if I had waited till the day of our marriage, like, we wouldn't have these issues because Christians also mm. counsel each other in these terrible ways where we, we lie to our young people. We lie to our married people and say like, well, this is, this is because of your prior sin that this sex isn't working out. And yes. it's like sexual compatibility. Christians all listen to me is real. I've heard so many Christians try to debunk the idea of yep. compatibility. Compatibility is no joke. It's real. It's about yeah. 
how often you want to have sex, how frequently, what style, what your kinks are. There's so many different elements so to it. So much. And so much. And yeah. we thought we were like open because we would talk about it. Like we would make out a lot. But we both were so devoted to waiting till marriage that it wasn't that hard because I just, I was so devoted. Like it didn't matter if we talk about it. Like I thought we were a great fit, but it turns out that because of, I wasn't fully healed. And honestly, I know a lot of Christian people probably won't like me saying this, but I don't really believe in waiting till marriage to have sex anymore just because I... I don't believe like, oh, you should test the car, like that whole thing, like test drive the car. But then part of me is like, ah, if I would have like had sex with him, it wasn't that I would have decided his car wasn't good enough. Like it just had nothing to do with his body. His body was amazing. Like who cares? Um, it, it had everything to do with, I was not free in my mind. And he was so manipulative and hurtful to me during the day that when he would try to be sexy at night, I didn't want someone who had verbally abused me during the day. To want, I didn't want them touching me or being in my body. It felt so unsafe. So all these things compounded. And after a year and a half, I, I lost it. Like I went from thinking about this is forever and ever, and I made my bed, I'm going to lay in it, to all of a sudden waking up one day and thinking... I don't have to do this. Like something just triggered in me. So it went from me thinking, this is my bed. I have to lay in it and I will figure out how to make this work and going to counseling with him, with a Christian counselor, um, to realizing that he wasn't putting in the work. I, I had a month of separation. I was very intentional saying, go get help. Like, please, like, I need you to be able to process with me. I need you to understand why you lash out and are angry with me for no reason. Why you wake up in the morning mad at me for no reason. I need you to process this. I told him what was happening and he still did not go get help. So after about three months of him actively knowing after I had already left for a little season, I talked to the Christian counselor and she told me as a church counselor, I cannot tell you, like, I cannot counsel you to get a divorce. I can't. Wow. He does not like, he does not hit you and he does not um, cheat on you. And I, I remember praying he would hit me because some nights the emotional manipulation spinning me around were so bad that I would just be on a ball in the ground on the ground crying and he'd be like yelling at me or threatening to kill himself like squeezing a knife being like you wish I would just die and I'm like no like no I just want us to love each other <laughs> like oh. I love you and I'm just trying to get you to love me back and be gentle with me like if, if I felt safe with you, I promise I'd have more sex. I could do better because I didn't. For a while, I didn't want to have sex. I would do it because I thought I should. And I was trying. I really was trying. But he didn't make me feel safe. And I was, I had a right to not feel safe around him. But after about, I'd say from December to March, he knew something was wrong. I left in February. I said, get help. Please go on your own. Three months later, I'd worked up the courage. My grandma had told me one day you will wake up and you won't be afraid of being not financially stable without a man or being afraid that you lost the love of your life. You're just going to wake up and have the strength to go. And I did that day. I remember it very clearly. It was it. So I set up everything I had to do for the divorce. And it was a very hard season afterwards, not because I didn't process the divorce I had, I had processed it with that counselor for months. And she told me the last thing she told me was physical abuse is measurable. Cheating is measurable. How many times someone cheats, the depth of how far they go, but emotional and verbal abuse isn't measurable. And even though it's not biblical grounds for leaving, I can actually, as a psychiatrist, diagnose him as a narcissist. I need you to know this won't change. And there's two options. You can believe that this is like your devotion to God to stay in this marriage, or you can leave, but I would have to tell you that you have to stay like pure and never get married again for it to be right in the eyes of God. And I was like, you know what? I'll take my chances. <laughs> like, because I'm like, if I accidentally stay in the, if I even give him another few months, okay. And I start to get pregnant, like I get pregnant because he was starting to be like, oh, can we like not use protection? Like, I think he knew something was up. 
Uh, wow. So yeah, he was trying to lock me in, buy a house with me, get a pet together, like things that had not happened up until this point. He started like doing, he'd love bomb me and like be sweet for a couple days and try to have unprotected sex. I knew something was up. And I just knew if I bring a baby into the world with this aggressive, mean man, like they'll have to go through this abuse. And I said, that's enough reason to leave. So I did. And I, for a few months, I did go a little wild. I dated a lot and that would be where I needed the healing. It wasn't that I needed healing to process the divorce that I had processed, but me creating desire again and like understanding what it was like to be attracted and be taken care of as a woman was a completely different rodeo. Thank you so much for sharing that entire story. There's so much intrigue in that to me because for me, my dad's corporal punishment and then my dad didn't give me the message of purity, but other men gave me the message of purity. Mm. And then other women piggybacked on that message and were like, that's true. You have to be modest and you have to like let a man protect your purity. And like just all of these messages of what I was told a male female relationship is supposed to be completely yeah. did not serve me when the rubber met the road. And I actually tried to have human relationships with human people. Like in theory, if you want to tell girls, save yourself from marriage and let a guy protect you and let a guy, you know, it's just like, fine, but this isn't Cinderella. Like we are way evolved past this and women aren't shutting up anymore. Sorry that some of you believe that, you know, women are allowed to preach and everything that ish is going to be over really soon yeah. because it's just, it doesn't hold up. And when you hold God's people and I consider everyone God's people, not just quote saved yeah. people. You hold God's people from their true destiny, from their talents, from their giftings, from their voice, from having a voice. You are not going to win in the long run because that is not God's mm. call for his people. That's you were not supposed to be these like disjointed, meek, quiet, whatever. And so many of us didn't fit into that perfect paradigm ever. All of that said, like, it's really interesting to notice how you and I were both fed so many of the same lies about purity oh. culture and that our worth was in our virginity, which is a social construct. It's not even a real thing. Mm -hmm. um, that look at the relationships that we both tried to force ourselves into. Like our stories yeah. are so, so, so similar. And, and I think I lost like the identity of the virgin and like that was like part of the crisis it, being married. I didn't know how to not be like virgin harpist. Exactly. I, I lost the same exact sense too. I was like, wait, I thought I like really thought a Christian was a virgin. So then when you're not a virgin, even if you're doing it in quote the right way, you're still like, okay, wait, but now where is my worth? And that is supposedly being submissive, letting the guy lead. But when you find yourself in a relationship that is not compatible, whether it's just sexually not compatible, you could be married to a gay man in Christianity, a gay woman, like, so you could be yeah. incompatible in that way and forcing it in that way. Or you can be incompatible in that when we're told that virginity is all it's about and all you have to do is find someone that reads the Bible like you do and goes to church on Sundays no one taught me how to avoid abusive relationships or abusive people or actually choose a partner that right. was my equal. So, it, you know, your story is so similar in that way. Yeah. And I, I have to speak to that submission part. It was very interesting to me to get married, think I was marrying someone who was quote unquote equally yoked. And I'm not saying he had all the problems. I had a lot of work to do too, but what he did to me was abusive. And in those moments, I thought like, that's just how marriage was. I had kind of gotten isolated. We moved to Florida from Louisiana. My family could no longer see. My dad could no longer keep him in check when he would make, um, you know, verbally abusive statements to me. I should have seen the signs before we got married. For so long, I thought the the sin was divorce, but I really think the original sin was going against myself and getting married. That was the actual sin because for me now I define sin as going against that intuition, that wisdom that God gives us. That's the Holy Spirit. And I did go against that. We were premaritally counseled by our church back home at the time, no longer my church. I don't really 
pick one. But um, it, it, they, that counselor didn't come to our wedding. Like he told him like you, what you're doing to her is um, mental abuse. And like, until you're mature enough, you can't get married. I still married him. I was the dumb one here. Okay. I wanted no. to get married so bad. I was already an old maid in the South. It was like this internalized Southern culture mixed with purity culture. But anyway, so now all this to tell you why I feel so nurtured where I'm at now. Actually, one more thing. During our marriage, he told me I couldn't go to church where I wanted to go to church. I wanted to start exploring progressive Christianity. And there was a unity church that still honored Jesus. And the pastor was a woman who walked around barefoot. And there were gay people, gay couples at the church. And my ex-husband flipped his shit when he went in there and saw like gay couples. He lost it. He could not handle that the, the woman was leading the church. And I got asked to play the harp there for the first time by the church in years because my old non-denominational mega churches, like, I always feel like I wasn't good enough, like good enough Christian girl to be put on their stage. I don't know. I never got asked but once to play for them. Mm -hmm. But this church I was a part of for one week and they were like, come play at our vigil for the, um, there was that really awful shooting um, that happened at the club down there. I'm sorry. The LGBT. Yeah. yeah, it was awful. And so I went and played for that. And I remember my ex-husband was like pissed that I chose to go play because it was like supporting the LGBTQ community. And I remember we lived in a little Airstream trailer in an RV park and I started crying in the shower. That was like my only place to get away from him. I and love he was crying like, in the shower. <laughs> I know it's like extra intense emotional <laughs> moment, but this was not a fun cry in the shower. Like he had told me like, you're my wife. And if you don't listen to me and submit to me, like this is going to really be a bad, bad thing for our marriage. If you go back to that church, I'm not, not telling you what will happen, but it won't be good. And I was just so scared. So all that to say, I was already wanting deconstruction because after I got married and I realized, Oh, if you get married as a Christian girl, every, you're the perfect Christian now. Like you've hit that level. Like you're yep. everything. Yeah. And I didn't feel different. Like I didn't feel like I thought I would feel. I had so much disappointment and already going through that. So he did not like the new agey ideas that I had. They were all just way too wild for him. So that was something we didn't agree with. So now I'm a divorced woman. Okay. Like we, we end this relationship. I go home. I have my, um, what do you call it? You say you lovingly remember tramp age, <laughs> tramp age. So I had a tramp age without sex, except with one person that like promised he would marry me and be my hero and all this stuff. Went to my parents, said he was going to marry me. And I, at the moment I was like, he's going to save me from like this terrible thing that happened. No lies. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was totally going through that. But at the end of that stage, I realized I get to choose again. And I, I started going through deconstruction. And then I decided to get serious with God again and figure out what I really wanted. And when it came down to it, I had no shame anymore. I was raised in a very nice, wealthy home. And I had lived and chose and never complained about living in an RV park with the ex-husband because I loved him and I wanted to start our own family, even if that meant starting in the literal dirt and dust. Well, <laughs> now I got to choose again and I decided I wanted to marry a wealthy man and I wanted to have security and to feel nurtured. And I remember writing a list and it was like a very spiritual man. I no longer wrote Christian. You had to be spiritual because I realized that a spiritual person was really convicted, you know, mm -hmm. it was more than just rules. It was like a conviction of heart. Mm -hmm. um, that was so important to me. And I wrote down someone who laughs when I laugh and laugh when I, and cry when I cry. Just so many important traits that I didn't have in my marriage, something nurturing. And I love that. I had, thank you. And I had abuse, obviously with that corporal punishment from my dad. I had you know, I didn't have financial support when I needed it most in my life from my parents because they didn't want to, I don't know, they just weren't giving in that way. And I think looking back, I just needed someone almost in a way to re-nurture me, reparent me. And I, I 
grievous attraction for older men, okay? <laughs> Yes, it was about money and security, but it was also just about nurturing and emotional maturity. I decided like, okay, let's go 40 plus. And long story short, the creator of Silly Bands added me on Instagram and he happened to be, I think at the time, 53. Yeah. When he reached out to me, he just followed me. I reached out to him and I was like, hey, like, I, I'm single. I'm like, he, I looked him <laughs> up. I looked up his net worth. I was like, this is like crazy. Like the silly bands guy followed me. And it was, I, I mean, yeah, obviously like I vetted to make sure he was like a wealthy dude. But after that, like initial, um, very shallow part of me had its moment. We genuinely fell in love. We developed a friendship that was like no other. He was from Ohio and we would Skype two hours or FaceTime two hours a day talking about business, talking about spirituality. And that was the start of a beautiful relationship that is now going on almost two years. And mm -hmm. I'm so nurtured now. I love being with an older man and I cannot imagine ever dating a younger guy again. And I'm living in sin because we are not married and having great, <laughs> fantastic, steamy <laughs> sex. <laughs> Oh my gosh. We have, we have so many parallels in our story and you know, it's funny cause I, I want to say, I want to judge you, but I, that's not the right phrasing, but I could judge you and be like, Oh really? You Googled his net worth. Like my shallowness is like, are you hot? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like at the end of the day, like we all probably have these like things that are obviously surface level, judge a book by its yeah. cover. What do you want in the shallow way? But, um, you know, because even really it's shallow to say, I want a Christian because mm -hmm. what is like, what you said is so true. Like, what does that actually mean? It manifests in so many different ways for people. It, it could mean they're incredibly damaged or incredibly spiritually healthy. And you yeah. really don't know. You could, you can you get don't. the whole gamut of people. So it's like, I think that's even a shallow thing to hang your hat on and say that you want. So it's, it's beautiful that you articulated that you want a spiritual person because you're right. We've been taught the heart is deceitful, but in reality, rules and regulations in black and whites are deceitful because they're not bred within you from a true sense of conviction. They're bred yeah. from these external sources that are telling you who to be and how to be. So when you find someone that has a genuine sense of conviction at the bottom of their soul, like my partner does and your partner does, then, yeah. then there's no stopping you both. And then they're not, you know, I mean, I don't know about you and I definitely ask you like, is your man holding you back in any way? Like never. Exactly. He pushes me. <laughs> <laughs> same. And you know, does he subscribe to the same exact spirituality that you do or would you say it's it's different um he was he's had such a rough life um I'll, real quick though i do want to answer that question but to go back um just for the record like he was extremely successful like when i was a kid silly bands were all the rage and like his company made millions and millions and millions and millions sold billions of them however as soon as I <laughs> dun, dun, dun. got to know him, he was like, so I made some bad investments. And like, <laughs> in reality, I can give you a stable life, but like, I'm not like what you think. And um, we've been working together to really reamass his wealth and what people think and how I act and joke on the internet is like a sugar baby because I make fun of the age gap. Like, in reality, we work together every day. He we live like a pretty normal lifestyle. Um, definitely very blessed, but not what people think like when you Google, right? So I just want to like say that real quick. Um, we are working back up to that though. I can guarantee that we are going to have all of that again, but we're doing it together and it's really cool to work with him. But does he prescribe to the same or subscribe? Is that the word? To the same? No, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, practices. Okay. So when we met, I was still in the early stages of my deconstruction. And I must admit, I'm still really evolving. I would kind of describe myself as Christian ish because I love um, Jesus and I believe in the Trinity as God. But um, I don't look at the Bible the same way as most Christians. And I also believe in like the culture changes and things like that. So I don't know. I, I'm Christian-ish. I love Jesus. So yeah. he was brought up Catholic, dirt poor, were, like 
had no parents that supported him, abandoned him, abused, like physically, like terrible life. And he was always brought to like church with his grandparents, but believed in God, but never like practiced, if that makes sense. Like he's like, God, like help me talk to God when there were tough times, talk to God when there were good times, but it was never like a, like I go to church every weekend type guy, but he prays like so faithfully to himself. He has a very personal relationship with God. So we talked about that when we first met and now I'm getting into like, uh, reading Oracle cards with him and things that are not traditional Christian things. And I'm like, babe, do you believe in it? Cause believe me, when I do a reading, it's accurate as fudge. Like, I feel like God really speaks to me through these different tools. And he just smiles and he's like, anything you touch, I believe in. And oh. that's his support <laughs> for me. Like that is his support for me. He's like, I just know that you're super connected to God and you're super intuitive. So it doesn't matter what tool or what book you read to me bring to me like he's not the kind of guy that's gonna go to a spiritual bookstore and read a book every night he's a businessman he focuses on business all day every day but if i'm like hey can i read a chapter of this to you together can we start the day with breath work and meditation or do you want to go to church with me he's going to go like mm. he's just all in for whatever it is and nothing gets in the way of his everyday practice of prayer he is a very prayerful person and it's just so inspiring to see that like he does not have to use his spirituality to prove a point to people like I was taught. He just is a good person without proving it, without mm -hmm. using a faith as a crutch or a rule book. He just believes in being good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't think I'm usually too open about this either because I've felt such a weight and responsibility of taking on this like Christian label and uh, yeah and I want to stay in the Christian space because for me I define Christian as someone who loves Jesus yeah I think the other definitions have warped and perverted and changed Absolutely. it to something that it's not so yeah. like in a way I'm just like no I am holding firm in this space because I'm reclaiming mm. what it actually is and that doesn't mean you have to believe everything that I believe it just means right we both believe in love. We both believe in justice. We both love yes. Jesus. We are Christian. Yeah. Everything else you believe about your sexuality, every other way that you reach out to the Holy Spirit to figure out what relationship works for you, what friendships, what boundaries, how you dress, how you behave, how you act, whatever, like that to me is part of that personal relationship yeah. that you develop. But to your point, I've found so much freedom and I've been drawn for so long to quote non-Christians that are very, very mm -hmm. spiritual because they have presented me so much freedom. Mm -hmm. People talk all the time about freedom in Christ, but that has felt like shackles to me and to so yeah, many of us. Totally. Yeah. You're like, what freedom are you talking about? I can't even turn left or right without someone judging me and telling me that I made the wrong move and, and stealing away your, your belief that your heart can be trusted. It's all been yep. so demented and manipulated. So for me, you know, people ask what it's like to be in a relationship with a quote, non-Christian. And I feel the same way as you. It's like his freedom and his behavior and watching him react and make choices out of genuine intuition and yep. intellect and the freedom of like not caring about being judged by his faith community. You're yep. like, oh, okay, that's how you behave. I mm -hmm. add Jesus to it. I add my prayer to it. And then I feel more confident to move forward. So for me, this unevenly yoked thing, I'm like, no, I am perfectly beautifully yoked with this person because they're elevating the way I see my spirituality yeah. with Jesus. And it sounds like mm -hmm. you two have the same sort of relationship with it. Absolutely. And like he would say he's a Christian. He's just not like what you'd be like, oh, he's on fire for Jesus. Like, no. <laughs> Thank like, God, because who knows what that means? <laughs> who knows what that means? <laughs> But no, he's, he's wonderful. And I don't know if I actually mentioned this yet, but he, he is significantly older than me. He's actually over 25 years older than me. And he's getting to show me what it's like not to live in fear. For so long, I was brought up thinking that older white men control. Um, he does not, I go into business meetings with him and he tells the men in the room to be quiet and listen to me. Like, it is the most empowering That's relationship <laughs> I have ever. Oh, it's so hot. It's the most empowering, empowering relationship I've ever been in. He has given me like 
people might think that like, oh, he must buy you all this stuff all the time. Like, no, what he did for me was give me a place to live. Like I didn't have to pay rent. Like I moved in with him after six months of dating. That's what he did for me. And I could develop my online platform. He gave me a safe place to explore. I was always taught that if you weren't doing, you weren't worthy. My dad had me waking up early, writing in my prayer journal, practicing the heart, makeup on, clothes on. Then the homeschool teachers would get there. Like I was homeschooled, but I lived the most structured life. Three hours of practice a day. Did you check this off the list with him? He's a very fluid entrepreneur. He works a lot, but sometimes we work at night. Sometimes we work in the morning. Sometimes if I'm not feeling good, I can lay in bed all day and he will never look at me and be like, lazy. Like I was so used to that because that was like not a Christian trait. Like you couldn't really rest. Like you had to work, but like you could rest a little on Sunday. You know what I mean? (laughs) Totally. Yeah. And then you're at church for five hours. You're like, am I resting? This is horrible. (laughs) Yes. I totally relate to that. Yes. Um, growing up my parents before like non-denominational church was like the cool thing with like the cool youth pastors it was like the really wild churches where you would literally be there for five hours and everyone would be slain in the spirit so that was my childhood it was I I would be there all day it was exhausting you just gonna get um, slain so you can take a nap on the floor <laughs> Yes, slay me now. Oh my gosh. Maybe that's why I like Shavasana so much in yoga. It brings back like the one happy time. <laughs> but yes. Oh my gosh. Uh, but let me tell you guys, for those of you who are like, could I ever like be with an older guy? Like that must be so weird. Like his body must be older. That's like weird. I have to admit, like at first that was a weird thing. Like seeing him, there wasn't like this, oh, like you sexy mother trucker type thing. He's a very good looking older guy. I absolutely adore him. But that attraction did take a while to to birth. But I also think I'm the kind of person that's just not attracted to someone unless I like get to know them in general. Yeah. So, I mean, that's just how I operate. But in general, I think if you've never given an older guy a try and you're interested Don't judge someone based off age. Ageism is a thing. People think you're too young to do miracles or too young to be this spiritual bullcrap. You can be an old soul and have everything. Like Jesus loved children and um, so important to not be ageist. And I was like, I was like, well, maybe like this could be like a thing, but like I can't really marry him because by the time we have children, like he might be too old, blah, blah, blah. So all that kind of held me back from creating a a true conscious partnership at first. And the more I fell in love, the more fear came up because it was like, shit, he's probably going to die before me. And I have to mentally prepare that I could spend the last 20 years of my life without the love of my life. And Mm. that was very dark. Um, But the cool thing about age gap relationships is you have to face this inevitable truth in every relationship is that it will end. And um, I think you just face that sooner in an age gap relationship. The reality is I could die before him. Um, So we don't know. And once I decided to sovereignly decide this person is healthy for me, this person is edifying to me, this person lifts me up, this person challenges me to be more than just an influencer, but share spirituality and start a podcast that uh, challenges me, that helps me grow. He was the one that told me to do all those things. Like, you need to do this. Like, stop thinking that you're not worthy of doing this. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be a pastor to start all this. I had all these rules in my head. He was the one that broke all that down for me. And now I'm a life coach. I have a top 100 personal development podcast called Enlighten. Go listen to it, y'all. Mm-hmm. Subscribe. <laughs> I, I mean, all these things that I've become now, I am that girl. I'm that girl that he told me I was. I'm that girl that I was affirming to myself. But I needed like that close friend that could say, I see that in you before I saw it in me. And he was that. So I challenge you that if like you're kind of curious about it, an age gap relationship or an older human has shown interest in you, but you've kind of shut it down thinking that it would be taboo to go for it because he has been the best healing medicine in my life. (laughs) Mm, Thank you so much for sharing all of that. I love that. Yeah. And in reverse too, if you're a dude and older woman is pursuing you, don't be an ageist there either. 
No. And I, I always go is... for younger men. My oh, you do? Is, yeah. I'm older in my relationship. <laughs> How many years? If you don't um, mind. Yeah. Wait, what is it? Five years? Four years? Four years. That's a lot like for a opposite gap. Yeah. You're used to seeing like older rich guys with young girls. And the thing I loved about Robert is he's always like complimented me for my brain before beauty. And that was not something I was used to, especially as like an influencer who was uh, working as a model when we met. It was very weird for me. And I almost would get irritated. It was a trigger for me that he would not treat me like my dad and compliment my beauty all the time. It was a big trigger. I thought he couldn't possibly be the one for me if he didn't like give me those words of affirmation, but he was. He was just building up a different part of me that needed to be built up. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. So, beautiful. Yeah. Oh, he's right here. Oh. oh. Um, I think I put the car keys on the hook, sweetheart. They're not, then they're in my bag, the Lululemon bag behind the Fendi bag on the, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like you're my like bags. Okay. Yeah, you're like behind the Louis Vuitton, behind the Chanel, right in front of the... <laughs> I literally have to tell him though, because he won't know the difference between them. That's amazing. He's got to, got to get the car keys. But anyway, I hope that that could be an inspiration to you and, um, to give it a try and, and the physical stuff, it, it will definitely come regardless of age. But when you're in this age gap world, be careful that the guy isn't treating you like a piece of meat, because that is a common thing. I have to be upfront about that. There are yeah. older men who want to exploit younger women when for their body and like, provide them with a lifestyle in exchange for a relationship and that is a sugar relationship and it's a very popular thing right now but is being glorified on the internet and I'm not shaming anyone because like hey sex work is work and like it's a hustle it is straight up a hustle but what I have found is true love and I now coach women on how to find and position themselves in the environment to find a successful, wealthy, secure, emotionally available, spiritually mature man and helping people believe you can have it all. Like you can't, you don't just have to be like the Christian girl that doesn't have wealth or doesn't have abundance in her life. Like you can have everything. So. Yeah. I love that. Thank you for making that distinction. Cause you and I, when we had dinner a while back, um, you were talking about how you met definitely a handful of duds when you went on yes. this search because because yes. exactly what you're saying that there can be this ill motivation to why mm -hmm. why a man is going into it um, and you got to stay safe like so safe regardless of what age you're meeting up with like if you're on a dating app or whatever like be in public people are really creepy and older yeah. men can be really creepy um, it's just a fact. Sorry. Like not trying to be ageist, but it is a fact. And the first time I met Robert, he looked at me in my eyes. He didn't look at my boobs. He didn't look at my butt. He was there for my, my being. And that was just so refreshing. <laughs> yeah. So, and you need know. to look for that in any, any age. Anyone any will treat you like a piece of meat. Yeah. Get embodied. That's one thing I wasn't taught as a Christian woman to, to cause I was taught my heart was deceitful and I married someone that it, it, if I was connected with my body, I would have felt fear. I would have felt rejection mm, yep. and I was not connected to feel that rejection or admit it was there. Thank you so much, Sophia. Thank you. The God is great community. Any of you that made it to the end of this conversation, I hope that it was so edifying. I loved mm. connecting in this way and where can everybody find you? Please advertise yourself. Yeah, <laughs> I would love to. So my podcast is called Enlightened and you can easily find it on any podcast platform by searching Sophia, S-O-P-H-I-A, Enlightened. It'll pop right up. I'm on Instagram at Sophia Spolino. You can find that by searching Sophia Spa. Like if you can spell my name like that, it'll pop right up. And same for TikTok. I've recently grown on TikTok significantly. And now I do online coaching for people who want to build their brand on TikTok, Instagram, start a podcast, or just girls who are interested in dating advice, cultivating a dating profile, or just consulting on what to avoid or look for when you're in this age gap world. So you can reach out to me on Instagram or go to my website, sophiaspolino.com. Love it. All right. Yeah. Thank you all for listening. We love you all. We love God you bless. all. God bless.